in here to hear him. All right, it's 20 till. Stay with me now and we'll go quick tonight. Verse 6, Luke chapter 2, started a series last week on the clothes of Jesus. I want to enter into that tonight. Chapter 2, verse 6, the Bible said, And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Heavenly Father, I pray you'd bless us now. Uh, that we would learn some things, that we'd get excited just about thinking about you and your son, Jesus. And I pray that you'd open up our minds and hearts tonight to the word of God. And we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people see it. Amen. I started this series last Sunday night, The Clothes of Jesus. And I, I think I mentioned six to you, but I had left one out, actually. I left out the grave clothes of the Lord. Some of you know that story where uh, James and John came to the grave. and Or, excuse me, Peter and John came to the grave. And Peter went on in and it mentioned specifically how the Lord's grave clothes were laying there. So we'll add that one in. I didn't have that in the list last week. I apologize for that. But I mentioned seven times, seven different times the Holy Spirit made a point to mention some specific piece of our Lord's clothing. From each of these, I said that we're going to look and try to get a literal description of what it's talking about. Then a doctrinal examination. See if there's anything we can learn about the Lord from that piece of clothes. And then a practical application. Something that we can learn about ourselves or about how we live for the Lord or should be living for the Lord. Now I believe that this is going to give us a good start on our theme for the year, Reaching for More, as we look to grow spiritually as individuals, as families, as a church, and reach for more spiritually. And I believe a good place to start is thinking about Jesus. So we're going to think about Jesus on these Sunday nights. Tonight, obviously, we're going to look at the first one, the swaddling clothes that are mentioned in verse 7 and verse 12. Let's go ahead and put that first picture up. Bring some of those lights down. Now, this is what you typically see when you see the picture of baby Jesus in what we consider swaddling clothes. So I'm going to leave that up there for a few minutes. And uh, I'll talk to you about some other things. First of all, the literal description, swaddling clothes. Now, one dictionary defined it as this, strips of cloth wrapped around a newborn infant to hold its legs and arms still. Now, you start researching this, you'll find out that in the Middle Eastern days uh, that they had a purpose to this swaddling, and it was just that, to help uh, the, the limbs to form right. They would kind of strap the babies down uh, with these swaddling clothes. And it said, uh, some of the Bible commentaries I was reading said, isn't it funny that they thought they had to keep Jesus straight? Uh, you don't have to keep Jesus straight. He'll take care of himself. But nonetheless, as was custom, it said they wrapped him in swaddling clothes. Now, the word swaddle means to bind uh, as with a bandage. And so it's more than just a blanket that we typically see. Keep in your mind tonight now the bandage idea. As you study, it appears there was a custom among the Middle Eastern families and somewhat even still today, one of the first things that they do when a baby is born, they clean the baby up and then they wrap them up tightly in those baby blankets and give them back to their mom. And the Middle Eastern families would swaddle their children. In Ezekiel 16, uh, verse 4, the prophet Ezekiel is talking to the nation of Israel from God, obviously, and, and he's talking to them about the things they've done wrong as a nation and metaphorically there he uses the example of a baby being born and in that verse he is saying the things that normally happen for an infant did not happen for you Israel because of what you did wrong and so he's kind of rebuking them in that verse and in that verse he says thou wast not swaddled at all and so obviously even in the prophet Ezekiel's book that was a common thing for babies you say well preacher that, that seems uh, like common sense why would you say that well then isn't it interesting and I don't want to jump ahead of myself but isn't it interesting interesting that the Holy Spirit said to those angels, the angel said to those shepherds, it'll be a sign unto you. Yep. If it's something that they do, wouldn't it be weird if somebody said, well, you'll know which baby you're looking for when you find one in diapers. How I many of you understand that wouldn't be a very good sign if you was just looking for a particular baby because all babies wear diapers. So uh, it's a little bit like that here when he says, you'll see the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. I think both things were part of the sign, not just that he was in the manger, but the swaddling clothes in particular. Let me describe it to you if I can, the typical Middle Eastern swaddling of a baby. They would do much like we do. They'd have a, a square piece of cloth, about a yard square, they would say, and then they would lay that baby diagonally on that cloth and begin 
begin to fold the corners tightly over the baby. But then what is a little different than the way we do it now is they would take the swaddling band, they would take this piece of cloth, and they would begin to wrap it. It's a gauze-like cloth strip, and they'd wrap it around the baby. Go ahead and show that next one, brother. Now, obviously, this one here, it's obviously some rich family. They were portraying here. They had like a gold swaddling band. But you need to have this idea that they would wrap the cloth around the baby, and then they would take these swaddling cloths, swaddling bands, if you will. They would then wrap it, and the, the study that I saw, I couldn't find a picture to show it, said that they would start, and I'm going to read that to you. They would start and wrap it around the head from the chin to the top, and then take it all the way down around the baby. Let me read you this description here uh, that one source defined it as. It said, swaddling infants, swaddled infants do not have the free movement of their arms and legs. The legs were placed closely together, and then the baby's arms were placed at its sides, and the piece of swaddled cloth was folded over the baby's feet and arms. That's the big cloth. But then listen to this. Then the swaddle band, described by most as a gauze-like cloth strip, was wrapped from under the baby's chin. Now we don't see that in this picture here, but they were pictured they would wrap it around as if you were circling the baby's face, under the baby's chin, over the forehead, and then wrapped around and around the infant all the way down to the ankles. When the baby was finished being wrapped in the swaddling band, it, had, it all had all the appearance of a mummy. The swaddling band now is a long, show me the next one, brother, a long strip of cloth, narrow, uh, cut into long pieces, and they would fold the blanket, if you will, the square piece around the baby. Then they'd take this long, uh, thin cloth and very... Uh, thin in width and also thin in material and they'd wrap that baby up good and tight as if to make sure they were holding it all in place. And that's the idea most of us have, except we normally didn't know about the strips of cloth. We just pictured in our mind the uh, baby blanket. And so it's pretty much what we had pictured, but with the addition of this strip of cloth wrapped around. Shake your head if you understand what I'm saying so far. All right, so that's the part that's a little different from us, but that's the part that's going to play an important role here in just a minute. So the literal description, much like a baby is wrapped up now, but with the addition of this swaddling band added to it. Let me give you a doctrinal examination. Two things I want you to see prophetically. Just go back to that regular picture of a baby, brother. That'll be fine from here on out, I think. I might have one more. First of all, I want to say two things doctrinally that I see from this swaddling clothes. Now, let me say also that uh, swaddling clothes were what the commoners did. Uh, the wealthy, the royal, they would do things differently. So the first thing it says to us is this. When we see the Lord, the God of the universe, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, wrapped in the same clothing of the common baby, if you will, it shows us, first of all, He is without discrimination. The use of swallowing clothes shows us that our Lord was sent not to the wealthy, not just to the royalty, not just to the mighty, but the Lord... Now listen, to this point in their society, the poor and the needy were often looked down on and shunned in their society. I preached this morning about the rich man and the beggar. It was a true story, I told you. It wasn't just a made-up story, but there was a real rich man and a real beggar, and he was laying out there hoping to get the crumbs from the master's table, from that rich man's table, and we know that he died. Uh, we, we're in... You know, it's insinuated there that the rich man ignored him, that the rich man paid no attention and didn't offer any assistance or any help. As a matter of fact, when he got sick and he had sores on him, the dogs came and licked him. It didn't say the rich man offered to help. He didn't offer to get him some medicine. He didn't bring him in his house. And so we can see throughout different places of the Bible, we know that those that had leprosy were banned from society. They had to go and live outside the city gate. And so often the poor and the needy, those who were down and out, were shunned in the society into which our Lord Lord was born. So it's very important that you understand something. When the Lord showed up like this, when the God of heaven, when the Messiah they had all been waiting for showed up in swaddling clothes, coming to a poor family in just regular people garments, if you will, what it did was it leveled the playing field. His humble beginnings showed this wicked world, I am come for whosoever will. And we've talked a lot about the Calvinists and how that they believe only a select few will get to be saved. And I'm thankful the Lord didn't believe that. Hey, listen, God's not a Calvinist, just so you know. God's the one that wrote, whosoever will can be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he sent his son not to the palace, not to the wealth. He sent him to a poor family and he let him be wrapped up like the common children will be wrapped up to show this world that I come 
come for everybody and whosoever will can come unto me. Spurgeon said it like this. He said, if you look again, you shall observe no pomp to dazzle you. Is the child wrapped in purple and fine linen? Ah, no, he says. Sleeps he in a cradle of gold? No, the manger alone is his shelter. No crown is upon the babe's head. Neither does a coronet surround his mother's brow. A simple maiden of Galilee and a little child in ordinary swaddling bands is all you see. Now hath heavenly glory wedded earthly poverty. Listen to that. Now hath heavenly glory wedded earthly poverty. I'm thankful for that because I was poverty, all right? I was what maybe this, my family would have been overlooked by much of this world. And I'm thankful God is not just a God of the wealthy, but He's a God of whosoever will. He said, Now hath heavenly glory wedded earthly poverty, and henceforth let no man dare to despise the poor and needy, since the Son of the Highest is born in a stable and cradled in a manger. How low the King of glory stoops, and how gloriously He uplifts the lowly to share His glory. The doctrinal examination here, the first thing we see about God being wrapped in swaddling clothes is that he is without discrimination. That he has come that everybody might be able to come to him no matter to whom you were born, no matter where you were born, no matter your standing in society. But not only that, I want you to see that these swaddling clothes and this birth here, a doctrinal truth is this, he was born to die. He was born, you say, well, we're all born and we're going to die. No, he was born to die. Amen. It's the only reason he was born. Do you understand that? Let me show you something. Now, I don't know. This first part is purely speculation. I called some preachers and asked them what they thought about it. And it's one of them things where they would say, you know, I never thought about it like that. But I don't think it would be a stretch. I'd be all right if I heard somebody preach it. That's what they said. So I'm going to share this with you. Have you ever thought about uh, the fact that it seems that the delivery of our Lord kind of caught Joseph and Mary off guard? Have you ever thought that? You say, well, no, not really. Well... Let's think about this just for a minute. Now, I know that they didn't have due dates. They didn't have all the things we have now. And by the way, due dates are not always right now. Is that right? They don't have all the technology that we have now to give them a real good idea as to when the baby might come. But the Bible says she was great with child. And I believe we all understand that means that common sense will tell you they knew she was close. But they were also starting on a long journey here with a woman that was great with child. Don't you think, let's just look at it like this. If Joseph had known early that morning that it's going to be today, don't you think he would have started early in finding a place better than a manger for her to give birth to this child? Now, we had uh, evangelist Chris Hewitt here and his wife not long ago, and they sang together, and I told you that their baby was born and just lived a few hours and died. And I don't know if I told it here or not, but they actually delivered their baby at home. He delivered their baby at home. Let me just say, thank God that didn't happen in our house. It would have been something like this. Becca delivered the baby by herself. That's what it would have been in our house. As she's saying, get up off that floor. And I'm hollering up there, I'm praying for you, honey. You say, why in the world did that happen? Because it, it came on them sooner than they had planned and they could not make any other arrangements. I wonder about that for Joseph. Mary doesn't, it's not a doctrinal truth. It doesn't really matter necessarily. But I wonder, uh, you know, you would think, well, the ends were all full because, of the, uh, because everybody had to come because of the new tax law. The whole city was full. Well, I understand that. But don't you think if he had started looking that morning, he would have went to house to house if he'd had to to get his wife a fitting place to have a child. Not to mention, I think he would have searched for a midwife as they often use in those Bible days. It appears to me like they knew it was getting close, but maybe they didn't know it was here. And then all of a sudden she gave him one of those Joseph sits now. And they go knock on the inn. And he says, I'm sorry, we don't have any rooms. And they don't go to another door. They say, can we use the barn? I mean, it's now. I don't know. You say, why does that matter? Well, I'll show you something else here in just a minute. Have you ever considered where in a barn some of this stuff came from? like the swaddling clothes and things like that. Well, she packed it with her. Well, stay with me just for a minute. Swaddling clothes were not uh, only used to wrap babies at their birth. They were also used, them swaddling straps were also used to wrap bodies of those who were injured or had died. And let me just backtrack and say this. If you study in the, the Middle Eastern culture, it was normally the midwives that did the wrapping of the swaddling clothes. It was normally the midwives that had them. And normally the midwife that wrapped the baby and did the swaddling of the baby and then she would put that baby back in its mother's arms. And there's no midwife involved here. Does everybody understand that? Amen. No midwife, just Mary and Joseph from all we can see. 
And so those swaddling clothes were not only used to wrap babies at birth, they were used to wrap bodies that had died. Several sources say this. Now listen, this is interesting to me. And I've checked this out with several preachers too, and they agree. They think this is what, uh, this is what took place. Several sources tell us that in the Middle East, people traveling long distances were often met with many hardships and trials on their journey. Now, we know that they didn't travel like we travel. They didn't have cars, they didn't have boats, they didn't have planes like we have today. And so when they traveled in the Middle East, much of it was walking. We know that they had, Mary and Joseph probably had a donkey. We typically see them riding on her riding and him walking. And so it was a rough way to travel. We also know from reading other parts of the New Testament that there was many bandits on the roads in these days. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. And that story, even though that was a parable, uh, he's alluding to the fact that there are some roads where bandits normally jump people and rob them and beat them and leave them laying half dead. So often, when they were going to take a long journey in the Middle East, they knew there's a chance somebody might get hurt or somebody might die just from traveling even in the weather of the Middle East. And so because of that, listen now, there was a, uh, there was a tradition that they would do. And so because there was a chance, and particularly when they was going in a big group, there was always a chance that at least one might get hurt or that one might die on the journey. And so everybody in the group would take a, this is what it said, these swaddling bands, a long uh, gauze-like cloth and wrap some of it around their waist, under their clothes. Everybody would wrap a long piece of gauze around their waist. And what they would use it for is on the journey, if somebody got hurt or somebody got killed, now they couldn't just carry that body like it was, it would deteriorate too quickly they wouldn't even be able to keep it to the end of the journey so what they would do is everybody would take off those death rags those swaddling cloths if you will they would take them off and they would use it to wrap the body with the spices and the ointment so as to preserve it to the end of that journey so everybody understand that shake your head if you understood what I just said they would wrap some around their waist as a safety measure and then everybody would take that off if somebody got hurt in their caravan and they would wrap that body like a mummy so that they could take it to the end of their journey and then give it a legitimate burial now listen if somebody died they would use those swaddling cloths called the same thing used to be the same word they would use them at birth they would also use them for injuries and death death rags Go ahead and bring that up, brother. It'd be like what you typically think of as used on a mummy, a gauze-like strip. When we see pictures of mummies, you know what? That's dead bodies that they wrapped up. And uh, they, was, they would do that, as I said, to hold those ointments. Remember when the women came to the grave of Jesus, said they brought spices and ointments to anoint the body? How many of you remember that? They would bring those things to anoint the body and it would help preserve the body not to deteriorate so quickly. But see, if you just put it on the body with nothing to hold it close to the skin, it wouldn't work very well. So they would put those anointing oils on those dead bodies, wrap them up in these cloths, these swaddling cloths, and it would hold the ointment on the skin so as to preserve the body as long as possible. So people would wrap these around their waist on the journey in case anybody got hurt. Most people think that here's Mary and Joseph and they're in the barn their baby's being born. And most people seem to think that they didn't have anything else to use. So Joseph took his off, his death rags, and wrapped baby Jesus in that instead of the typical cloth used for a birth. Now let me ask you something. If that was what the shepherd saw, that'd probably be a sign, wouldn't you think? He said it'll be a sign unto you. The babies will be wrapped in swaddling cloths, clothes and lying in a manger. You say, preacher, what does that say to us? If that be the truth, and most people think that's a good theory and very sound logic, it means this, that even in his birth, Jesus was showing the world, I came to die. It's why I'm here. That he came not to live, he came uh, you know, not to grow up and be some famous person, but that he came to die. He came to give his life on the cross for our sins and he came to die. Make no mistake, the Jews and the Romans did not prematurely end the life of our Lord. The very purpose of him coming in that manger, the very purpose of him being born to that virgin and being wrapped in those grave clothes, if you will, from the very beginning was to say, I'm coming to do the job that I'm here to do and that is that I will give my life on the cross of Calvary that they might be saved. It was the plan from the beginning, and we can see it here at his birth. The doctrinal examination is one. He is without discrimination. He was, he was clothed just like the commoners would have been. To say, I come to everybody, and he was clothed in death rags to say, I'm here to give my life. What's the practical application of these swaddling clothes? You can go back to that other picture of the baby brother. Just back it up one. What does it say to us? Let me give you a couple things on this. What does it say to us when we look at Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, wrapped in at the very least, commoner's clothes. 
or perhaps even in death rags given to him from his father. Somebody said if that was the truth, isn't it interesting? He was born and wrapped in Joseph's clothes and died and was buried in a Joseph's tomb. I don't know. But either way, you say, what do we get from it? First of all, here's what we get. Humbleness is important to God. Humility is important to God. For God to allow His Son to humble Himself in such a way, to be wrapped in death rags or commoner's clothes, to be laid not in a nice bed, not in a nice house, but in a manger where animals would normally eat or lay. God would do that to let Himself be humbled in the sight of man. God is showing us that humbleness, humility is important to God. He entered this world. He took on the form of the poor. Took on the form, the Bible says, of a servant. And then even as an adult, He said, The Son of Man hath not where to lay His head. So even as an adult, the Lord Jesus didn't go out and make a big living. He didn't go out and try to make something uh, important of himself, even though spiritually we know how important he was. But in society, you know what he was? A very humble, a very meek. He brought himself to, as a poor man and stayed that way. You say, what does that say to us? It just needs to remind us that if the Lord Jesus would humble himself, we need never think too much of ourselves. We need never start thinking we're something because we've been saved for a while and we know how to put the right clothes on and thank God for that and we know how to come to church and carry our Bible. Hey, never start thinking too highly of yourselves. The very God of heaven said, I will humble myself as a servant. I'll let them wrap me in grave clothes. I'll let them lay me in a manger because I want the world to know humility is important to me and he wants us to keep that in our hearts. You know, Jesus was eventually magnified by the Heavenly Father. He was eventually raised from the dead and, and we we now pronounce him the king of kings and lord of lords but none of that happened until he hum humbled himself in the eyes of man he he literally let himself be thought of as less than royal so that he could be the king of kings and lord of lords for us and our savior humbleness is important to god you know what if we're going to have any hope of magnification in our lives it'll have to be preceded by humility let me say that again to you well i want to be the best and i think you ought to want to be the best at whatever you do whether, whatever job you're in, the young people playing sports and making good grades and all that stuff, I think we're supposed to strive and give our best at everything we do. But let me say something to you. God's never going to help magnify you as long as you're proud. If He lets His Son come in like this, you can guarantee He don't want us walking around thinking we're something. Amen. Amen. Let's be careful. As a church, listen, as a church, we better make sure we understand it's all because of Jesus. And if it wasn't for Jesus, this place wouldn't even be here. And if it wasn't for Jesus, it'd be wiped out tomorrow. Do you understand that? We're no match for the devil. We're no match for the forces of, of the wicked, except for the good shepherd that puts a hedge around us in this place. Hey, if it wasn't for God, our families, like the family of Job, would be taken out tomorrow. God forbid we ever start walking around thinking we're anything. When you start thinking you're something, just remember, hey, God cares about humility. He let His Son come in this humble fashion. Not only is humbleness important to God, but submissiveness is important to God. Even as a babe, Jesus wrapped in those grave clothes was already heading His life in the direction of His Father's plan. According to 1 Peter chapter 1, the Father's plan was for Jesus to give His life on the cross from before the foundation of the world. Jesus came into this world knowing, I'm coming to do the will of my Father, and that is to give my life on the cross, a sacrifice for all. As 12-year-old, He reiterated and said, I must be about my Father's business. As an adult, He proclaimed, I do always those things that please the Father. And on the cross his very last words was it is finished the whole life of the Lord Jesus starting here wrapped in grave clothes wrapped in death rags to say to the world I'm here to do what my father sent me to do and that is to die as a sacrifice for their sins and I want to say I thank God Jesus came I thank God Jesus died I thank God he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world and I'm thankful he was willing to do it he was willing to say no to temptation willing to say yes to the cross Willing to give his life. You know what we see? Submissiveness is important to God. Hey, Jesus, as a baby, he let them wrap him in those death rags to say, I'm here to fulfill the will of my Father. You know what? The will of God should affect all parts of our lives. The will of God should be the number one prayer for us parents, for our children. Not that they get a good education, not that they make good money, not that they marry right. All of that's important and you should pray about all that. But you know what our first prayer should always be? God, I want my children in your will for their life. 
Because, see, we really believe that in the will of God is where you find the most peace. That in the will of God is where you find the most happiness. That in the will of God is where you find the most joy and where you have the most meaning in your life. And we ought to be asking God to make sure we are in His will. We ought to be praying to God that our children grow up and get in His will. You know, living for God, serving God, telling others about God, being a good testimony for God and so on. All those things should affect our everyday decisions. Our everyday decisions ought to be affected by submissiveness to the will of God for our lives. How we, how we orchestrate our family ought to be affected by, Lord, I want to be in your will. Jesus, starting out, showed a submissiveness that is important to God. Humbleness is important to God. The last part of the practical application, stay with me. Inclusiveness is important to God. As I already said, He came to a poor family. Now think about this progression, if you will. He came to a poor family. He was announced by the angels to the lowly shepherds. The lowest job, they say, in society in those days. But then he was uh, welcomed by some religious leaders. If you remember, he was taken into the temple on that eighth day. And there were two religious leaders. Simeon and I believe Anna. And they were two of the leaders of the synagogue. And Jesus was welcomed by them. Now you've got to understand something. Leaders of the synagogue, that's another level from shepherds. So we're talking already now about a different level of society. So he comes to the poor family. And you say, how do you know they're poor? Well, because when it came time to offer the sacrifice, they could not afford a lamb. They brought the turtle doves. And if you study in the Old Testament, that was the exception made for the people who could not afford a lamb. So Mary and Joseph were not wealthy people, very poor. So he sent to the poor family. And then the lowly shepherds are the first ones who are told. And they come and bow and worship the Lord and go out and begin to spread the news. And then they come to the synagogue and the baby is presented there. And those leaders of the synagogue, those two, they hold him and they're worshiping God and they're thanking God. And so there's a connection there with another level of society. And then as a small child, we know that the three wise men came to represent royalty, if you will. And they bowed and they were accepted by the Lord Jesus there. And they came and they worshiped and were changed. And you know what the Lord has shown us? That everybody's welcome here. Everybody's welcome to Jesus. The poor, the lowly shepherds, the lowest in society, if you will, but then also the religious crowd, then also the royal crowd. Hey, sometimes we get it flipped and we think he's only to the poor. No, he's not only to the poor. The Lord wants everybody to be saved. He wants the richest man in the world to be saved. I want the richest man in the world to get saved and join our church. Amen. It's to whosoever will. Now, sometimes we don't think about that. Now, I know the Bible teaches us that it's hard for a rich man to be saved. That doesn't mean God don't want him to be saved. And so in his early life, we see that he goes to the poor and that he's accepted. Uh, he accepts the shepherds as they come and worship him. And then we have the religious leaders in the synagogue. And then we have the royalty represented by the three wise men. Jesus came to all. And listen, you say, what does that say to us? We need to make sure that we don't ever look at anybody, at anybody, as if they're not worthy of the gospel. You make sure of that. What an arrogant thought. What an arrogant thought for anybody to look at another person and to have any inclination as, you know, I don't know, I don't know about them. Listen, there would have been a lot that wouldn't have known about us. Amen. And there were some that I'm sure did pass over our family. Amen. But I'm thankful the Holy Ghost didn't. Amen. I'm thankful the Holy Ghost stopped at our house. And invited himself in and we said come. And I'm thankful he's made a difference in the Shirley family. Because somebody knocked. Listen that parable of the sower. He went out and he did not look at the ground. Do you understand that's not very good gardening. How many of you understand it's not good gardening not to look at the ground. We grew up at our little farm. We only, had, uh, we only had a little piece of land in the midst of a bigger farm. And so right down behind the house was the only flat piece. So that's where they planted the garden. It was a horrible spot. Terribly rocky. But thankfully they had three sons. <laughs> so daddy would disc up the ground. And then he would say to the three sons, go get all the rocks and throw them out. I may have said this recently. I said it somewhere. Normally we like throwing rocks. But isn't it something when your parents tell you to do something that's not fun anymore? Ah. Yeah. Oh. We hated that. If they were to ask me, I'd say, Mom, Dad, this ground's terrible. Don't plant anything here. It's not going to work here. Now they use my brother's farm. There's a little better spot out there. But listen, they didn't have any choice. But you know it's not good farming, if you will, just to sow your seed on any ground. But in that parable of the sower, did you notice that he just went ahead and sowed on every piece of ground he came to? 
He didn't look at one piece of ground and say, well, I, I doubt very seriously anything's going to come from this. I mean, this is where the birds always come and pick it up, and, and I'm not going to bother. Or he didn't look at that stony ground and say, well, I mean, there's good rock under this, and so even if it takes root, when the sun comes up, it's going to wither away. Or he didn't look at the thorny ground and say, there's no sense sowing here, because once it springs up, these thorns are going to choke it out. He didn't do any of that. You know what the parable of the sower teaches us? That our job is not to try and decide what is and what is not good ground that our job is to realize Jesus came to whosoever will. He came to all. And our job is to sow the seed on all ground. Hey, listen, we didn't look like good ground when God came to our family, but I'm thankful some of it will bring forth fruit, some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100-fold. Your job is to just sow it everywhere. Hey, listen, maybe somebody would have walked over Brother Blade's family as he's testifying, and he's talked to me recently about some of the battles in his home, and maybe they would have looked at his house and the house is there and said, oh, what are the chances anybody's going to believe? I tell you, it might not have been good, but he's thankful somebody sold there. Amen. Thankful some bus worker came. Who was the first one that came? Brother Roy came. How about that? Somebody else who was reached. Somebody else that lived at the end of, I've heard Brother Roy say, at the end of a dirt road and his daddy was a drunk, but he's thankful the old bus came down the dirt road and knocked on their door. Hey, listen, Jesus, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, allowed himself to be wrapped in at least commoner's clothes, most likely death rags, to say to the world, hey, I'm, I'm come to everybody. Anybody can approach me and be saved. And we ought to never, never look at anybody and think there's no sense in it. There's no point. I know sometimes there's hard cases and I know sometimes we want to get discouraged but like these girls were singing, some of us prayed for years. Some of us prayed and prayed and prayed and it seemed like it was bad ground and then all of a sudden at the last minute that seed took root and Brother Mike's daddy got saved and Brother Ken's daddy got saved and Miss Dahl's brother got saved and my daddy got right with God and Brother Roy's daddy got saved. Hey listen, our job is to give it to everybody. Bless his holy name. There's some practical application here. Inclusiveness. Let's don't be, hey listen, I believe in dressing right when you come to church. I believe in looking right. I believe we ought to try to come to bring a good testimony to the one we're coming to worship. But let's don't ever be that church where when somebody walks in and they don't look right, they don't feel at home because of the way we look. The way we act. Hey listen, I don't care if they smell so bad you're about to throw up. If they look like they don't got a seat, you ask them to sit down. And then you can go to the bathroom and throw up. Praise God. I remember one time me and Brother Travis had been on bus route. And we had knocked on her door and started talking to a lady who had just moved in. And we got her to come. And she came to church. She had just moved to the area. She came and visited one Sunday and then she didn't come back. And I started talking to her but why she didn't come back. And she didn't act like she wanted to say. Finally she told me. And she said, and I, don't know, I don't know if it's true or not. This is what she said. She wore pants. And now listen, I think ladies ought to wear dresses and skirts to church. I got a long reason why, and I'll give that to you another night. Let me just go on the record and say that. If you've been saved for any length of time at all, you know that. And that's the way I believe, all right? But I also believe anybody can come in here and they should feel welcome. And she said that she had went to the bathroom, and in the bathroom she was in the stall, and she heard some ladies talking about that woman wearing pants. And she thought they was talking about her. And so she left mad. She didn't come back. I don't know what them ladies were talking about, and I don't know if they was talking about her, but I'll tell you this. If they was talking about her, they're foolish. And if it was you, you're foolish. And I know that I came and preached on the tongue the very next message because I was so mad. <laughs> I ain't sure God told me to. I went ahead and just preached on it because I wanted to, praise God. God forbid we ever make anybody feel like they can't come here to church. The Holy Spirit will teach them. After they get saved, after they get right, they'll hear preaching and they'll grow in the grace and the knowledge, especially if those of us that have been saved a while act like we're supposed to and dress like we're supposed to and say like we're supposed to say the things we do. If we'll do our part, it'll come easy to the newcomers and the new converts. But listen, at the same time, they should never feel like we don't want them. Nobody, nobody of any background, of any social order, of any race or anything, Listen, they ought to, they're just as welcome as you are and I am. The baby in the manger said, everybody's included. The shepherds can come. The religious crowd can hold me. The royal crowd can come. Anybody can. And we ought to feel the same way. Our job is to sow the seed of the gospel in all lives. Let's pray together and just thank God for the swaddling clothes. Thank God that He came to whosoever will. Thank God that He came 
with the purpose of fulfilling the plan of his father. Brother Michael, won't you just play on the piano for us a little bit, buddy? We ought to thank God that he did it the way he did. If he would have come to the royal, it wouldn't have been the same. If he would have come to the wealthy, it wouldn't have been the same. But God in his wisdom humbled himself, wrapped himself not only in flesh, but in grave clothes or commoner's clothes, showing all of us we ought to be humble, showing all of us we ought to be obedient, showing all of us that whosoever will can come and are welcome. Father, I thank you for the swaddling clothes tonight. I thank you, Lord, for loving us, for being good to us. I thank you that you sent...